case you might be joining with us this morning for the, the first time of, uh, in our services or first time in a while. We've been working through the book of Romans in our Sunday morning services, so we've made our way up now to the beginning of chapter 4 and uh, just uh, seeking to revel in the incredible truth of salvation that Paul is outlining for the Roman Christians in this epistle, and certainly God intended it to be a benefit for all of his people by including it in his eternal word. And so we're thankful for the privilege we have to come and uh, be blessed by it. My original intention, in, intention in this sermon was to work through verse 8 of chapter 4, but as I got involved in the message and typing it out, it just there was too much here. It would have taken too much time to go through those first first aces, eight verses, so we're just going to look at verses 1 through 5 this morning. Let me read those verses, please, for you, if you follow along with me in your Bibles. Paul continues by writing this, What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We're going to be looking at uh, this argument the Apostle Paul makes using Abraham as his test case. And we're trying to understand his Point, why is he bringing this into this discussion right now? And what importance does it have for his original audience? What importance does it have for us today? And I think it has much. I've entitled the message this morning, The Timelessness of Salvation by Grace Through Faith. The Timelessness of Salvation by Grace Through Faith. Let's go to Lord in Prayer. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of being able to spend this time together uh, in your worship and your praise and drawing close to you. Uh, Lord, as individuals, but also as a congregation. In this case, perhaps as a congregation through technology, but nonetheless, we are a, a church. We are a, a called out assembly. We are a specific group of people called out in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, given certain purposes and privileges. Lord, this morning, one of those purposes is to worship and edify you and to minister to our brothers and sisters. But it's also a great privilege, Father, to be edified and built up in our most holy faith. And as we spend this time now in this service looking to your word, it is our prayer, Father, that you would open the teaching of your word, the preaching of your word, the text that we will look at this morning to our hearts and to our understanding. Father, we confess this morning our own weakness and frailty. We know that I confess as the preacher I have no ability to, to understand rightly in my own strength or to help anyone else understand in my own strength this truth. We are all dependent upon your Holy Spirit. And our prayer this morning is that he would open the word to us, that we would both understand its truth, and then he would apply it to our life situation, and then give us grace to obey and conform our lives to it. So we're thankful for the privilege. Lord, would you bless and honor the preaching of your word, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were with us last week, either here or online, we considered the final five verses of chapter 3. And in those verses, it was Paul's testimony concerning the fact that God's salvation of sinful men comes by grace through faith alone. Now, that wasn't a new testimony by the Apostle Paul, certainly not in the book of Romans. This has been his theme throughout. But it was something that he wanted to drive home in a, in a fresh a way and an important way in those particular verses. And in those five verses, we brought out at least three major points that the Apostle Paul was trying to bring forth. Number one was this. Salvation by grace through faith alone eliminates all boasting. If you want to just look back to verses 27 and 28 of chapter 3, he said this, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And we wondered and we asked last week, why would that be important? And we considered because of the pride of man, we said that pride is at the core, it's at the heart of all sin, not just human sin, but even we find it described in the scriptures as being at the core of, of Satan's sin and rebellion against God. Because pride is there, it should not shock us that man would even have a struggle to not allow pride to creep in his understanding of how one gets saved. 
And when you consider the various religions of men, in one form or another, those religions place importance upon something that man can do to therefore justify himself in the eyes of God. And if there is something man can do, then obviously that opens up an opportunity for men to have pride or to become boastful. But Paul reminds us the fact that since salvation is by grace through faith alone, apart from anything that man can do, that all men who receive salvation by faith in Jesus Christ can have no place to boast, can have nothing in which they can exalt themselves, but that all glory, all honor, all praise must go to God himself. Secondly, Paul wanted to remind us that because salvation is by grace through faith, it's universal in its scope. In verses 29 and 30 of chapter 3, he says, he asked the question of the Jews, is, is, is he, speaking of God, the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. And we are saying that he lays hold of a reality that all the Jews had driven forth in their hearts and minds from the time they were children. In fact, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, it was the, the challenge that God through Moses gave to the nation. It was the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. And it was something that fathers were to teach to their children and were to pass down from generation to generation. So if there was one thing that a Jew that was actually listening and paying attention to the teachings of his Judaistic faith, he understood this. There is only one God. God. There is only Jehovah. He is the only God of all the world. So Paul says if that's the case, if there is only one God, is he the God only of the Jews? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? And therefore, I think Paul's point, as we pointed out last week, was this. If salvation is attainable through the keeping of the law, then the only people who would potentially be able to be saved would be Jews because they were the only ones that had the law of God given to them. But since God is the God of the Gentiles as well as the Jews, and since God has made salvation available only by grace through faith, then salvation is equally available to all, Jew or Gentile alike. The only thing that would preclude any person from benefiting from God's offer of salvation is his own unbelief. Therefore, since salvation is by grace through faith, it is universal in its scope. And then thirdly, we saw last week Paul stating that since salvation is by grace through faith, it actually establishes the law of God. Verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. And we know if you've read your scriptures at all, you know that many of the Jews criticized the gospel that Jesus, that Paul proclaimed because they thought in what he was saying, it made their law of none effect. And they believed that this law that they had received from God directly through their forefathers was now being uh, disintegrated or set aside or, or made as if it was wrong or, or not something they should have believed all of their lives. But Paul wants them and us to realize that in actuality, it is only through salvation by grace through faith that mankind could ever truly honor God by keeping his law. We read ahead, and we'll get there at some point in our study, Romans chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, Paul writes this, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And then he says this, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So Paul's point seems to be this, the only people, the only human beings walking upon the face of the earth that would ever have any hope of glorifying God by actually fulfilling his righteous expectations are those who have become new creatures in Christ Jesus. And since that comes by grace through faith, it is only those who have been saved by grace through faith and who have the Holy Spirit of God now living within them that are going to be able to glorify God by fulfilling the law. So far from salvation by grace through faith nullifying the law, he says it establishes it. It actually exalts the law. It actually brings into the life of an individual the ability to honor God by keeping that law because now he has a new nature given to him by Christ, but that new nature was received by grace through faith. These are Paul's concluding points at the end of chapter 3. But as we pointed out last Sunday, Paul's thoughts on salvation by grace through faith were only beginning with those final verses in chapter 3. They would continue and expand through the coming chapters of this epistle. And this morning, as we head now into this fourth chapter, Paul is going to begin to deal with the question which arises in the thoughts of many when they begin to consider the concept of how sinful men can be saved. Ask yourself if you've ever heard this question. Maybe you've even asked it yourself. Here's the question. 
if men can only be saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, then how were people saved prior to the time that Jesus came to the earth and died on the cross for the salvation of men? You know, if that question is being asked honestly, it's a fair question. And it's a fair question that deserves an honest and a thoughtful answer. And especially... It would be a legitimate question if it is coming from an honestly inquiring Jewish person who perhaps for the first time is hearing Paul's gospel and in it understanding that, you know what, even though I am a Jew, even though I'm a part of God's chosen nation, that's not enough to save me. And that being under the circumcision, having obeyed the law of God in that sense of being part of the circumcision, a part of the covenant, that's not enough to save me. That doing our best, humanly speaking, to live by the mandates that God's law was delivered to us by, our, by his servant Moses, seeking to keep that, as Paul said, I did, in, in the sense, humanly speaking, trying to keep the law. I was blameless in this, he wrote to the Philippian church, that that in itself is not enough to save us? You know, any honest, thinking Jewish person who hears Paul teach this would say, in essence, be saying that, you know what? Being a Jew isn't good enough. And in this case, and this is what Paul's going to bring out as an example this morning, even your revered ancestral father Abraham <laughs> could only be saved by grace through faith. But then they would be asking themselves, but how is that possible? How could even Abraham be saved by grace through faith if he died some 1,800 years before Jesus was even born? If it takes faith in Jesus to be saved, then was Paul implying that Father Abraham was not in heaven? Was Paul's gospel that he was proclaiming now excluding people like Abraham from ever having the opportunity of being saved? Again, asked properly, it's a fair and it's an honest question. Not only because it seeks a solution to the obvious gospel dilemma concerning all individuals who died prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus came into this world at a point of human history. As we look back on it, it's around 2,000 years ago. But there were thousands of years of human history prior to that. And hundreds of thousands, millions, perhaps billions of individuals who lived upon this planet prior to Jesus coming to earth, living and dying upon the cross of Calvary in payment for sins, and being resurrected for salvation. What about all those people? How in the world could they be saved? It's an honest and fair question that thinking people would in their minds try to figure out. How is it possible if you can only be saved by grace through faith in Jesus? How did any of those other people ever get saved? And in respect to the Abraham, the very patriarch of the Jewish nation, it forces them to face the repercussions of stating that salvation can only happen one way, by grace through faith in Jesus. This morning, we're only going to have time to begin Paul's testimony concerning these questions, but I do think our text is vital in helping us to answer this question, or at least to help us to understand this idea of the timelessness of salvation by grace through faith. So as Paul begins this teaching in what for us is the fourth chapter, he begins by asking a question. In verse 1, he writes... What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now as with much of Paul's teaching in these verses, Paul appears to be addressing the concerns of the Jewish people in particular, but as we pointed out so often, his teaching does apply to our Gentile needs and questions as well. And Paul asked those Jews, questioning the truth and the validity of his gospel, he asked this, Well, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? In other words... With relation to what I have been teaching, how does our father Abraham's experience either confirm what I've been teaching or disprove or invalidate my teaching? It would appear obvious, given what Paul will go on to write, that he's asking this question with respect to what he had uh, written back in verses 27 and 28 of chapter uh, 3, where he said, as we read earlier, Where is boasting, then it is excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So Paul's question obviously is asking, what did Abraham learn? Or more importantly, what can we learn from Abraham concerning the fact that salvation is by grace through faith alone? But we might ourselves ask the question, why would Abraham be somebody Paul would point out? 
Why would Abraham provide a good test case for what Paul is trying to get across in these verses? Well, the reason is this. For the Jews, at least, no one in their heritage was greater than Father Abraham. And for the Jews, it was believed that Abraham actually was afforded his patriarchal standing before God because of his own righteous actions. Can I read you a few quotes from some Jewish extra-biblical Jewish writings? 1 Maccabees 2.52, it's a question form, but it's, it's given as a rhetorical question. It says this, Was not Abraham found faithful in testing, and it was counted to him as righteousness? In Sirach 44, verses 19-21, this is said, Abraham was the great father of a multitude of nations, and no one has been found like him in glory. He kept the law of the Most High and was taken into covenant with him. He established the covenant in his flesh, and when he was tested, he was found faithful. Therefore the Lord assured him by an oath that the nations would be blessed through his posterity, that he would multiply him like the dust of the earth and exalt his posterity like the stars and cause them to inherit from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. In Jubilee 16.28, it's written, For Abraham was perfect in all of his actions with the Lord and was pleasing through righteousness all the days of his life. We should be able to clearly see that many Jewish writings, and it was probably the assumed position of all good Jews, that because Abraham had been found faithful in testing, that because Abraham had pleased God in his actions and were, was perfect before him, and because Abraham had lived such an exemplary life here on earth before God, that God therefore credited Abraham with righteousness. Now, if the average Jewish person had been raised with this understanding, then I think we should be able to understand why Paul's gospel message of grace was so difficult for all of them to accept and believe. It was flying in the face of everything they had come to be believe, everything that they had been taught concerning even the way their patriarchal, patriarchal father, Abraham, had found grace in the eyes of God. But Paul brings up Abraham's case in his line of argumentation because of this fact. Let's go back to our text, verse 2. Paul goes on and says this, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. What's Paul saying? Well, he's saying this, If Abraham was really justified before God because of the things he had done, then Abraham would have room to glory. He would have room to boast. He would have room to have pride in his relationship with God. But we know this. Paul has clearly declared it here. It's declared in other places of the scripture that boasting has been excluded. And the reason it's been excluded is because salvation is by grace through faith. So Paul's trying to get the Jews to think. Then what about Abraham? How was Abraham justified in God's eyes? Was Abraham justified by works? Or was Abraham justified by faith? This is what Paul is going to deal with in our text today. And where should Paul begin as he begins to discuss this issue? Well, as always, Paul begins with the Scripture. And he's going to take them back to an Old Testament verse. And I think it's interesting here, he just takes them back to one verse. We're going to look at several Old Testament passages this morning. But he's only anchoring his proof in one verse, which, again, kind of as a side note, ought to remind us of this. The Scripture is true. And if there is a verse, even one verse of Scripture, that gives us a teaching rightly understood within the context not only of that passage but of the whole Scriptures, we can anchor and base everything that we believe upon it because God's Word is true. And so Paul reaches back into the Old Testament, back to just one simple verse of Scripture in the book of Genesis, and he uses this as the basis for everything that he will say. His quotation in our text is verse 3 is this, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He finds that statement in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Let's turn to Genesis 15 this morning, and let's read that, and let's read some other passages in Genesis as well to help set the stage for Paul's argument here. Genesis chapter 15. Chapter 15 begins with the words, after these things, and after these things were the specific encounter. Remember Lot, Abraham's nephew, and others had been taken into captivity by a king, 
And Abraham with his servants and his men rode out after them, were able to free them and bring them back. And then uh, he's visited by this, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, and, and you know he's, he's promised all these things. And Abraham says, I'm not going to take anything from you. The only reward I want, the only reward I desire is what God himself will do for me. So it's after that event that these things transpired. In chapter 15, then we read this. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And then we have verse 6, the verse that Paul quoted. And he believed, Abraham believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him for righteousness. So in this text in Genesis, God is coming to Abraham and reminding Abraham that he is Abraham's shield and great reward. And in this interaction, as God reveals himself to Abraham, it, it causes Abraham to question or at least bring up to God a concern. And the concern is, God, I have no legitimate offspring. I have nobody to be my heir. In fact, the only heir I have potentially to all that I possess is this servant, this steward, Eliezer, who lives in my household. Why would this even be on Abraham's mind? What would prompt him to say such a thing? And why would he bring this up to God? Well, the fact that he has no offspring is, is directly related to some promises God obviously had made to him. Let's go back to the original promise, back a few chapters, Genesis chapter 12, and read what God said to Abraham when he first called Abraham to, to come out of the earth of the Chaldees and follow him. In chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we read this. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And then later in verse 7 of that same chapter, he says this, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. When God originally called Abraham by his grace, he told Abraham that he would make of him a great nation. And that through him, all nations of the earth were going to be blessed. And he goes on to tell Abraham that he would come directly from, this blessing would come directly from Abraham's offspring. But as of yet, Abraham had had no children and he was getting more advanced in his years. If we turn ahead then to chapter 13, we find another encounter between Abram and the Lord. This is after the meeting with the angels of the Lord. I think, uh, I think a Christophany and other angels related to, uh, um, the, no, I'm sorry, that's not this one. That, this is when um, Abraham and Lot separate. And it says in verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 14, we read this. And the Lord said to Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that a man can number the dust of the earth. Then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So here, several years later, Abraham still has no offspring, but God's promise to Abraham remains. God promises Abraham a land. He promised Abraham that his seed, his offspring, will become as the dust of the earth. But as we arrive at the text that Paul quotes us, we realize that even more years have passed, and Abraham still does not have even one child uh, that he could look at as an heir. And the current person in his household that stands ready to gain his inheritance is this steward, Eliezer. Abraham is obviously concerned. He, I think, not questioning God, probably questioning his own understanding. He's probably questioning, did I understand God's promise right? Did I hear it right? Did I get it right? It, it, maybe I missed it. How can all these promises that God seemed to clearly make to me ever come to pass if I can't even have one child as an offspring? Well, God's answer, if you're up to chapter 15 for us, comes again. We read them early in verses 4 and 5. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This, this Eliezer, shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. 
And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. God wants to remind Abraham and he wants to reinforce his promise to Abraham. And he says, No, Abraham, you're wrong. This Eliezer will not be your heir. Abraham, you're going to have an own son, a son born out of your own bowels, and this son will be the one who becomes an heir. And beyond this, God reiterates, he says, look at the heavens. Attempt to count the stars if you can. Such is going to be the incredible inheritance that is going to come forth from you. Then we have the text that Paul quotes in verse 6 where it says, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him, or credited to him by God, as righteousness. This is the verse of scripture that Paul quotes. And by quoting it to the Romans, he wishes to prove to the Jews and everyone else who might wonder that Abraham's ability to be counted righteous before God had nothing to do with anything that Abraham himself had done. He was credited with righteousness because he believed. And we're going to come back to that verse in a moment and consider what it was actually that Abraham believed. But for now, suffice it to show that Paul's argument is this. Abraham's righteous standing before God was not based upon works. It was not based upon anything that he did. It was based upon his belief or his faith. All right. Now, Paul goes on to elaborate what that means. So if you've kept your finger in Romans chapter 4, turn back there, please. And in verse 4, he says this. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Paul is, again, making a, a logical argument here that everybody should understand, and I think we do. He's basically saying this. If an individual does work for someone else, it could be any kind of work. It really doesn't matter in this sense of the illustration. That person who has done the work has a right to expect wages, to expect payment. In fact, Paul even is bold enough to say this, if you've done work for somebody else, the person you've done work for is indebted to you now. They are required to pay wages to you based upon what you have done. And why would they be required? Well, it's based upon God's own law himself. It is God in the scriptures that established that the laborer is worthy of his hire. So if somebody does labor, he's worthy of being rewarded for the work that he has done. Therefore, Paul's argument is this. By God's own righteous standard, if Abraham had performed righteous acts before God to attain a righteous standing with God, then God, by his own law, by his own declaration, would be indebted to Abraham and would have to repay him in kind. But Paul says, if a person does nothing to earn his righteous reward from God, in this case, and we know from Paul's argument already in Romans, it's because he's incapable of performing, performing any such work, but rather he chooses to believe God's promises, place faith in the promises of God concerning God's willingness to justify the ungodly, it could only then be on the basis of faith that any individual could ever be declared righteous before God. And that, Paul is trying to get across to the Roman believers, is exactly what the scriptures declare. Abraham, Genesis informs us, was counted as righteous by God because Abraham placed faith in the promises of God. We get on the Jews sometimes. We may even find ourselves making fun of them based upon their struggles that we read in the scriptures. But can you put yourself in their shoes for a moment? Can you imagine a Jew, just an, an honest, everyday Jewish citizen, coming into contact with the Apostle Paul and his preaching? And think how incredibly challenging the Apostle's words would have been to you. How they basically would have undermined everything you built your life on. Everything that you thought was true. In the case of most Jews, at least Orthodox Jews, everything you believed God himself had commanded you to do. And believed and had been taught all your life the way in which God expected you to live your life and in order to be pleasing in his sight. So when they hear these messages, can you imagine how challenging this was? And in this respect to Abraham, not only were their preconceived ideas of Abraham's righteousness being shattered by what Paul brings out, but now they were being forced to accept the fact that if someone as revered as Abraham was unable to earn favor with God by the things that he did, then how could any of them have any hope of ever standing before a righteous God? But we understand this, I hope, 
This was Paul's whole point, right? The logic that Paul is trying to bring to bear is this. That's my whole point. He says, I've been teaching that since the very first chapter. There's nothing you can do to earn favor before God. God is righteous. He's perfect. He's holy in all of his ways. You are sinful to the core. We are willingly disobedient. Not only have we inherited a sin nature from Adam, not only are we broken apart in our relationship with God because we were in Adam as our federal head, but, but we can't blame Adam for our problems either because we have volitionally, we have willfully sinned against God and we continue to do so. And Paul's point has been this. There is no way that any man could ever justify himself in the eyes of a holy and righteous God. We're too sinful. It's not possible. So as Paul brings this logical argument to bear, it is to continue to rip out from underneath, especially the, the minds and hearts of the Jews, but really anybody who feels that there's any way that they could somehow justify themselves before God by the things they do, helping to realize how, how impossible this is. He has stated unequivocally that salvation is not by works, but rather by faith. And now he is proving from the Old Testament scripture and from the testimony of their own revered patriarch Abraham but you know what? Salvation has only ever come by faith. What an amazing truth. What an encouraging understanding for us to receive. God's ways have not changed. God's plan of salvation has not been one thing for the Old Testament and another for the New. His salvation was not a certain way for Jewish people and a different way for Gentile people. No, Paul is saying salvation can only be found one way. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's not something that changed after the advent of Jesus coming to earth and going to the cross and dying for sins and being resurrected again. No, Paul is establishing from the very Jewish scriptures that this was the testimony all the way back to Father Abraham. This is what God has always demanded. It is the only way anybody could ever find righteous standing before him. It is not by works. It is by faith. But then that brings an obvious question, at least to me and I imagine to most of us. Okay, I'll take that. Abraham was, was declared righteous, was reckoned righteous because he believed, because he had faith. But what did he have faith in? What is it that Abraham actually believed. If we only had the Genesis account that we've read, and if we only had what Paul wrote here in Romans chapter 4, to be fair, we would be kind of at a loss to answer that question with any definitiveness, because neither of those passages really declare what it was that Abraham was believing. They just state that Abraham did believe, and God credited it with righteousness. But fortunately, we have other scripture that we can benefit from. And one of the major portions of Scripture that we can benefit from is Galatians chapter 3. So if you turn over there with me this morning, let's read something that Paul wrote to the Galatian believers, where he used this very same passage of Scripture after Genesis chapter 15. We know this. None of us at this present time in our lives are in a position to be able to ask Abraham personally, Hey, what level of detail did you understand concerning the redemptive purposes of God and Jesus Christ? Now, when we get to heaven one day, by God's grace, that could be a question we could ask him and understand exactly what it was that he felt, what he thought, what he understood. But we can't now because he's separated from us. We can't talk to him. But it is interesting to know that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, does inform us that Abraham apparently understood much more about the redemptive purposes of God through Christ than we may originally have thought. And Paul informs the Galatian Christians that Abraham understood and believed at least three things, at least I think we can find in this third chapter of, of Galatians. And let's look at those things this morning. One of the things I think we can say this, Abraham believed the gospel. Abraham believed the gospel. And I get that from chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Read along with me of Galatians 3. Even as Abraham believed God... And it was counted to him for righteousness. That's Paul, again, going back to Genesis 15, 6. Then he says this, Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Hmm. Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that God preached the gospel to Abraham. We know the word gospel is good news, all right? 
And the gospel, the good news that Abraham understood and believed, Paul even says here, that in thee shall all nations be blessed. In other words, in this this promise, in this prophecy, in this declaration that God was making to Abraham, one of the things that Abraham was drawing from this was the fact that whatever God was going to do through this seed, through this offspring, it was going to have worldwide ramifications. It was going to bless all nations. Can I just read you a couple of things again that were said? Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. God saying to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19, this was after uh, the Christophany and the angels coming to warn Abraham of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities on the plain. It says this, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? And then the Lord says this, And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And then in Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, we read this. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. This is when he was being asked to offer up Isaac, that son of promise, on the, on the, on the altar and, and kill him. And Abraham was willing to do it in obedience to God. Genesis 22 says, The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Again, a reaffirmation of the promise that had already been given to him before. It is this, Abraham, listen. This child, the one that he had just been willing to sacrifice in obedience to God, but that God says, no, I, I, I'm, I'm going to spare this child's son because I have a promise that, that I've made to you. And in that promise, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. This, Paul describes as the gospel. It was good news. And Abraham obviously understood this, that whatever God was promising him here in these promises reached far beyond himself. It even reached far beyond a child that might be delivered into the union that he had with Sarah, his wife. God was promising Abraham that somehow God was going to, through the promised offspring of Abraham, bless every nation upon the face of the earth. There was a promise of universal proportions in the gospel, the good news that God himself promised to Abraham. And it's interesting, the writer of Hebrews seems to maybe give us a little insight into Abraham's thought processes, that Abraham actually understood these things more than maybe we would originally give him credit through, when he states this in that great chapter of faith, Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10, he writes this, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and the heirs with him of the same promise. And then it says this, For he, Abraham, looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Why would the writer of Hebrews say that? He's saying it because he's giving us insight to understand that Abraham realized that the promise of God was bigger. It was bigger than his initial family. It was bigger than the birth of a child who later he came to understand was Isaac specifically. It was bigger than even what would happen to the nation of, of Israel that would come forth from their loins. What God was doing here was grander. It was going to affect all nations of the earth, but even that was bigger. Abraham, the writer of Hebrews, informs us, Abraham ultimately realized, you know, I'm not looking for a specific land that God could give me here on this earth. I'm looking for a place in God's own abode. I'm looking at a place whose builder and maker is God himself. Abraham had received a promise of good news. He had received the gospel, Paul tells the Galatians, and it seems like Abraham, somehow, by God's grace, understood a lot about that. And it was what was underlying the decisions that he made and the belief that, obviously, he had in the promises of God. So Abraham believed the gospel, I think, Paul tells us through his passage in Galatians. But I think we learned something else. Abraham's faith, what he believed rested in or was concerned with the idea of redemption. Back in Galatians chapter 3, let's read verses 10 through 14. Paul goes on to write the Galatians and says this, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 
But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Hmm. Here Paul informs us that Jesus redeems us from the curse of the law by what he was willing to do on the cross being made a curse for us. But then Paul goes on to state, and this was done, the reason Jesus did this, was so that the promised blessing that God had given to Abraham so many years before might actually come to fruition. That it might pass upon the Gentiles as well as the Jews through Jesus. And it goes on to state that it was the promise that he received by the Spirit through faith. Paul is informing us that somehow Abraham understood that this great promise he was giving to me related back to the idea of redemption. God redeeming mankind, both Jews and Gentiles. We might ask, well, Pastor, how much did Abraham actually understand for himself? Certainly not as much as we do. Abraham did not have afforded us the, the ability to look back in a past respect upon the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary. He doesn't have the New Testament scriptures to read and understand all that God now has made uh, understood to us as New Testament Christians. But I do find interesting that Jesus himself stated this in one of the arguments he was having with the, the Jewish religious leaders in John chapter 8, verse 56. Jesus said this, Your father Abraham... Rejoice to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. In other words, Jesus, and this is prior to him going to the cross, but he's speaking to them as he's arguing with them about him being the true Messiah and what he's come to do. He says, you know what, Abraham, <laughs> Abraham has been looking for this day, and now he's seeing this day, and he's rejoicing in this day. Well, why would Abraham have been looking ahead to something that he did not believe was coming to pass? Both Paul's testimony to the Galatians and Jesus' own testimony concerning the reality of Abraham's experience would tell us this. Abraham did understand, certainly not to the fullness that we can understand it today, but he believed, he understood that what God was promising to do through him and his offspring was going to bring redemption. It was going to somehow provide a way for mankind to become just and equitable in the eyes of God. He understood this. And when he, now from eternity, was able to see Jesus' entrance to earth and begin to see the unfolding of the plan of God within the realm of time, Jesus says Abraham is seeing it and he's rejoicing in it. The thing he had been looking forward to for so many years in his life. So Jesus seems to be implying that Abraham, although perhaps with imperfect understanding, believed God's promise of a coming Redeemer. And when Abraham was able to finally see it, he rejoiced. Old Testament saints, like Abraham, look forward toward God's promise of redemption. It's amazing how many Old Testament individuals record statements related to redemption. Job does it, and Moses does it, and Joshua does it, and, and the prophets speak about it. Isaiah certainly and others get into great detail concerning this. They understood the need for redemption. They understood that God had promised to prepare a way of redemption, and they were all looking forward by faith that somehow it would come to pass just as God had said. This is what Abraham was doing, Paul tells the Galatians. One third thing I think we learned from Paul's testimony to the Galatians is this. Abraham believed in the coming of Jesus Christ specifically. Abraham believed in the coming of Jesus Christ specifically. Back in chapter 3 of Galatians, verses 16 through 18, Paul writes this. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Paul's point here appears to be this. Abraham, although his understanding certainly was not the same level as ours, he understood enough of God's promise to realize that God, when he speaks of this offspring, has a specific offspring in mind. Again, consider one of the promises in Genesis that God made to Abraham in chapter 22, where it says this, that in blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. 
Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, informs us that Abraham understood that God had in mind not seeds, plural, many offspring, but seed, singular, when he gave him this promise. There was going to be one specific offspring that was really the ultimate part of the promise God was making to him. Again, I don't think any of us should think that Abraham understood that this seed would be the man named Jesus that we know of, historically speaking. But he did believe that God's promise was related to one seed, one ultimate offspring who would bring to pass all of these promises of blessing. And Paul, with no hesitation in Galatians, says, and you know who this seed is? It's Jesus. <laughs> he is the fulfillment of the promise God made to Abraham, the one that Abraham was believing in and trusting in, in which he was counted righteous. So Abraham, Paul is telling the Galatian church, believed God. And it was counted in him or credited to him as righteousness. And what did he believe? Paul tells us he believed in the promise of the gospel, the good news. He believed in God's promise of redemption. And he believed in a specific offspring through whom all, would, all this would come to pass. And that person, Paul tells the Galatians and us, is Jesus. So what is Paul's point in our text in Romans? We've spent very little time in Romans and a lot of other passages this morning, but that was Paul's whole point. He reaches back to Genesis and brings this statement of fact from the Scriptures to underlie his point to the Roman Christians. And what are we supposed to take from our text? It is this, that salvation by grace through faith is timeless. It's timeless. You know what, folks? It's important for us to understand this, but certainly was it important for the Jews. Never has any person, not even Abraham, been saved by any other means than faith. And never can any person at any time in history, either history past or history future, can any person ever hope to be saved except by grace through faith. Salvation, God's salvation, is always by grace, through faith, period. So how can anyone ever have any hope of entering into heaven one day? Well, again, if Paul hasn't made his point clear, he certainly is making it clear again this morning. It certainly cannot be by works. It certainly cannot be by anything that we could do. This morning, the example is Abraham. But can we just be honest? If Abraham couldn't make it by works, then you and I can't make it by works. And maybe in a New Testament sense, if the Apostle Paul couldn't make it by works, dear friend, you and I are not making it by works. None of us will ever enter into heaven's gates and be able to stand in the presence of God in all of his righteousness and be acceptable in his sight through anything we ever have done or could possibly do. It is an impossibility. We will never enter into heaven's gates through our works. Our only hope of salvation is placing faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary on our behalf. So the question, again, for the Romans, and the question, again, for us is this. Are you trusting? Is your faith in Jesus Christ alone? It is the only way that anyone can ever be saved. It is the timelessness of salvation by grace through faith. Father, this morning I pray you challenge us with these thoughts from Paul's teaching to the Roman church. His logic cannot be dismissed, but our faith does not rest in a man's logic. Our faith rests again, in believing the truth that you have given us. And the example that Paul gives of Abraham was that as you came to Abraham and spoke to him and made these precious promises to him, Abraham believed. And because he believed, because he took you at your word, because he put his complete dependence upon the veracity of your promises as his hope of redemption, you credited him with righteousness. It is no different, Paul points out, for anyone else today. And if we ever want to stand in your presence in heaven one day, if we ever want to be able to escape the 
the iniquity, the transgressions that we have so abundantly performed. And we didn't have time to do that. He will speak to that next in the next few verses as he brings up David and his situation and how he also was redeemed. Father, most of us are keenly aware of our own sin. There would be no way we could ever enter into your presence in our sinful state. If any of us will ever be there, it will be through the work of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can do nothing. We can simply only by faith receive what has been done, what Jesus has done for us. If there's someone in this room this morning that needs to trust Christ as their Savior, to depend upon Him wholly and solely for their hope of salvation, Lord, may you help them to do it. If there's someone watching this service online who is listening to this message and being brought to bear with the truths of this passage of Scripture, Lord, and they see clearly through the conviction of your spirit and the, the enlightening that he can only bring, that they need salvation and they're looking for answers, they're looking for good news, they're looking for hope. Father, this morning may they realize that the hope is real, but it is only in Jesus. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. So they must exercise faith in what he has done. And Father, for those who have trusted Christ as their Savior, who know and have confidence, not in anything in the flesh, but have confidence in the work of Christ as their hope. Lord, may we again afresh and new this morning just rejoice and praise you and worship you for the fact that you have made salvation available to us simply through faith. I don't understand why you would save any of us, and I certainly don't understand why you would provide salvation this way. But Father, it does evoke in us what it is determined to evoke, and that is all of our praise, all of our worship, all of our thanksgiving, because to you and to you alone, all worship and praise belongs. You are the reason for our salvation, and you always have been. We thank you and praise you. Ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.